Uh, Patrick, uh, please join me on the stage. So Patrick runs ProfitWell. Uh, also, uh, part of it was formerly known as Price Intelligently, but I think you guys merged it now to just ProfitWell. Yeah, it's all the same company, but the, the best advice is never change your name. Uh, it's it's a terrible experience, but uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 we did that. It was fun. And so you have a ton of insights uh, about SaaS companies and how they do the pricing and, you know, things that work or not. Uh, so I'm just going to let you uh, take it away and share with us what you have learned. Yeah, totally. And I think, um, so I, I'm a big fan of Kyle, um, respect him a ton, especially cause you know, we're kind of the, the, the only two people who consistently talk about pricing out there. And so, um, I think what, what I'll do is, is, is kind of either emphasize or, or kind of expand on some of the stuff that Kyle was saying. Um, I do have a couple slides just to kind of walk through. Um, but I, I think what I'd love to do is keep a good, healthy amount of time for Q and a, whether it's just from you pep or from the audience. And so yeah. let me chat for I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, maybe a little bit longer if I get a little too excited. And then um, there's a bunch of stuff I have in this deck that like, depending on the question, we can kind of jump around. So Okay, good. I'll be on standby. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll uh, hop <laughs> off. I'll be in the background and I'll come back once you're done with your uh, Perfect. slides part. Yeah. And so can you see my screen? I can't see any of anyone anymore. I'm going to assume you can see my screen unless Pep yells at me. But um, basically, what I want to start off with is giving a little bit of a framework for um, basically understanding and optimizing monetization just in general. And to give a little bit of background, um, you know, obviously got a, a really nice introduction um, there. But I, to give you some context on where a lot of this data and a lot of this insight comes from, um, is we build these products that do re what's called revenue automation. So the whole thesis is you should be able to plug ProfitWell into your billing system and it automatically makes you money or shows you where you know you should be optimizing uh, more revenue specifically for a subscription business. So in or the way we do that is we have this free ProfitWell metrics product. Um, it plugs into whatever subscription management system you're using, Stripe, Zora, Braintree, Recurly, whatever. Um, and it gives you free reporting all of your baseline reporting, so all of your subscription financial metrics, we enrich this for free with Clearbit and Full Contact, a whole bunch of things. And then what we do is we study that data and aggregate, pull out a bunch of insights, show those to you, but then also use a lot of those insights for our paid products that help with retention as well as pricing. Um, and so that's kind of a little bit of background. Um, we are able to have so much data because we have about 20% of the entire subscription market using that free product. So it just gives us a really good bevy information to understand like what's working and what's not, um, especially when it comes to monetization, which we've been talking about for um, almost a whole decade now. And so what I want to first do is like, really establish like what in the world are you talking about with monetization? Because when I talk to a lot of companies and brands or just practitioners or operators out there, a lot of times there's just this like misconception of what you're trying to do. And what's kind of funny is like, you're, you're smart, you're hardworking. Any other problem I give you that you don't know something about, if I'm like, Hey, you got to go figure out your people ops. Hey, you got to go figure out sales. Hey, you got to go figure out this. Even if you haven't done it before, you'd go, okay, I'm going to go read a bunch. I'm going to go do a bunch of things. And then you're going to apply, you know, kind of, you know, your thinking to that. With pricing, it's the exact same thing, except because it's pricing and monetization, we all get a little like scared, basically, or like nervous to do things. And so what I want to show you is like it it's a very kind of straightforward thing that does require effort, but it's not rocket science. And you heard some of that from Kyle before as well. But when you think about your monetization, the best thing that that, that has helped you know get this across to folks is that you've created some sort of value doesn't matter what you're selling, retail product, B2B SaaS, does, doesn't matter what it is, but you've created some sort of value. And then because we don't trade you know, goat for wheat in the economies that most of us play in today, you're basically saying this value is worth this much. And in that manner, your pricing is essentially the exchange rate on the value that you've created. And there's a lot of things that influence that exchange rate because in any business, you're driving someone to a point of conversion or justifying the price or the product that you're offering them. And so when I think about this exchange rate, I can change who I target, right? A different vertical might value the product more. Um, a different vertical might value it less, but there's more of that vertical. Um, I can go up market. I can go down market. I can change 
who inside the organization I go after, a whole host of things, right? Um, the product, not just in terms of the features and functionality that I add, but also in terms of how I package it, right? This feature inside this tier um, is worth this much, but if we pull it out, we can sell it to the entire base and it might be worth that much, right? So how we actually package and then value metrics is, as uh, Kyle was talking about a little bit as well. And then the price point obviously is a signal, you know, in terms, are you a premium product? Are you a discount product? And obviously it will affect conversion as well. And so the number that you should focus on is really the revenue per customer. If you look inside your business and it doesn't really matter like how you measure it, like obviously it matters for your business, but across all businesses, um, you're basically looking at that ARPU, the average revenue per user, per account, ACV, whatever it is. And you wanna make sure that's that number is basically going up and to the right. And if it's going up and to the right, depending on the rate, you are taking advantage of monetization in a good way. Um, if it's flat, you are not doing anything when it comes to monetization, or at least you have not implemented something that actually optimizes your monetization yet. And to give a little color, like this is not an exhaustive list, but there's a lot of easy and hard things that you can use to basically influence this number. Um, adjusting your pricing metric, your value metric, um, used to give away 100 units for that price. Now you're only gonna give 50 units away. Um, price increases, we could talk about that in a q and I got a little playbook I can show you. Um, that's actually relatively easy. It's uncomfortable, but it's easy. Um, Add-on strategy, it's one of the most underutilized strategies in, in most subscription businesses. And then there's these hard things. Um, and these hard things, they basically um, were easy 10, 15 years ago. You know, Going up market used to be easy. Now there's just a lot of companies already up in the up market and then feature differentiation used to be easier, but now everyone and their mother has a really, really good dev productivity. And so it's just one of those things where feature differentiation is harder and harder. And so that's, that's kind of the way to think about it. Like there's a lot more things, this is not an exhaustive list, but what are the things <laughs> that you believe will improve that revenue per customer? What do you think the things are going to boost the value of your product? Now, why is this important right now? I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because you're already kind of invested um, in pricing if you're listening to this and listening to Kyle, but just to give you a couple of highlights, and I have a lot more you know, that we've written or recorded on this, but the basic idea is that businesses today We've lost a lot of our power, um, and I'm going to breeze through some of these slides just because you know I don't want to fixate on them given the time. But because there are so many different products that now have lowered the barrier of entry to building a business or building a brand, where you know if we wanted to spin up a website, spin up a server, drive traffic to that website, by the end of the day we could. Um, because of that, in contrast to 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, where you know it was a lot harder to actually build a company. Um, there's just more density. There's more competitors out there, whether they're direct or indirect. Um, customer acquisition cost is up about 70%. Um, I'll share the slides. You can look at this graph if you want. Product value has gone down, meaning a product that used to be, you know, worth $100 in the eyes of customers, it's now worth, you know, 60 to 80% less because there's just a lot more product out there. So software and products have kind of lost their magic. And then customers are really, really, they're not ungrateful. It's a little bit of an aggressive way to put this, but um, basically consumer satisfaction has gone down. So NPS scores and aggregate have gone down. And, you know, I don't think anyone's going to stand up and say that products are worse today than they were six, seven years ago, but it's just you used to be able to put a login screen on a database and you were a god. And now it's like, if it doesn't have good support, good design, and I have a referral from someone I trust, like I'm not even going to give you the time of day, right? And so the market you can't really change but our response has really been like go deeper and deeper into acquisition right spend money like it's 2005 is 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 you know not necessarily something i've actually heard but it's the mindset a lot of people have and the thing i want to put across of why pricing is so important right now is that acquisition you need to be good at it to survive at this point not to actually thrive um, you need to be really really good at acquiring customers but that's kind of the the, the ticket to the game and what I mean by this is we did this study and we've published this year over year for a long time now where basically we isolated the three main growth levers, acquisition, monetization, and retention, and basically wanted to influence, um, you know, or wanted to see if we improved them by the same relative amount, what would be the impact on revenue? And so if you improve your actual acquisition, your net new leads, your conversion volume by about 1%, you're going to see about a 2 to 3% boost in your revenue. Now, if you increase your revenue per customer or your retention by about 1%, 
you're going to see about a four to eight X the impact. Now, I'm not saying that improving your monetization retention is as easy as spinning up a new ad campaign, hiring more salespeople. That's not what I'm saying at all. And I'm also not saying like, hey, you spend 60, 70% of your budget on acquisition, take that budget and put it on retention and monetization. I don't think that's realistic. What I'm saying is spend more money on acquisition, go more aggressively at acquisition, but make sure you're not ignoring these other two growth levers, which most companies do. So that's the basic idea of like what's happened in the market as well as a bit of a framework. I'm going to go to, through two really foundational things. And then in the Q&A, we can go through a bunch of tactical stuff. Um, I got data on so much um, and obviously some frameworks on a bunch of other things as well. But the really, really two like tactical things that I think are really, really important. Um, Kyle already talked about one of them a bit. Um, I didn't see his entire presentation or his talk. But the basic idea is like getting that pricing or that value metric right. And your value metric is how you charge. So this is intercom, uh, intercom charges, or at least this iteration of their pricing charge based on the number of people who use your live chat, basically. So if you have a thousand people interact with your live chat, your price is A, got 2000 the next month, your price is A plus B. Um, one of their big competitors, a company called Drift, um, they don't charge like that at all. They give you unlimited interactions, but basically what they do is they say the number of users, salespeople, marketing people, um, that's how we're going to charge you. And what's kind of fascinating about this is that these two are both successful companies, but they're going after a little bit of a different target. Drift is sales and marketing. If you ask them about support functionality, they kind of tell you to screw off a little bit. It's not that aggressive. Whereas Intercom goes after sales, support, marketing, ops, product, a whole host of things. So they need a little bit more of a genericized value metric. And in both cases, they're successful because what happens here is the the onus of basically expansion revenue or churn is on the actual usage or the value that they're getting from the product. So what I mean by that is instead of having to convince someone to upgrade from plan A to plan B, it's simply a matter of, oh, congratulations, you're using more. That's awesome. Um, we're going to upgrade to upgrade you to this plan. Or, hey, um, you know, looks like you're not using this as much or you have a different month. We're going to downgrade you to this other plan. And at the end of the day, it's all about growth. So what you're looking at here in the light green, um, these are companies using value metrics. The dark green is no value metric. Growth is about double. Um, also, mainly because churn is really good for value metrics. It's about half. So on the far left here, you're looking at feature differentiated pricing. Far right here, you're looking at value metric based pricing. And again, it's because you'll have more downgrades, but people churn less because there isn't that resentment of, oh, I'm only using 30% of what I'm paying for, um, which oftentimes happens with feature differentiation. So people will downgrade, they'll, they'll exit your, your business, come back maybe, but it's just a very, very clunky way to actually price. And then as I already mentioned, expansion, expansion revenue is actually really good. So these are the same categories, but basically you're looking at double expansion revenue um, as those who are just using feature differentiation. And we can go deeper into how to actually do this in a bit, but if you get your everything else wrong, but you figured out this metric, whether you're a consumer business, B2B business, whatever it is, everything else will be fine. I've seen just making sure you have a value metric. And right now there's about 50 to 55% of companies in the, in the SaaS space or subscription space, I should say, using value metrics. When we started ProfitWell, then called Price Intelligently, it was about 10% of all companies. So this is kind of where a lot of folks are going, but we have you know, some, some, some good hay to make. And the basic idea is make sure you think about what is your perfect value metric. Don't worry about charging for it. So for HubSpot, for instance, um, it might be, you know, the amount of money that you make through its marketing, um, marketing software, right? Well, can I charge on it? Uh, well, I could, we could probably track that, but will my customer agree to the measurement? Probably not because I wrote the blog post. So why, how much credit does HubSpot get? How much credit do I get for that revenue? And so if you can charge and your customer agrees on that measurement, then that's how you should charge. But in the case of like HubSpot, you probably have to find five to 10 proxies. So number of contacts, number of visits, basically proxies for that perfect value metric. And then I would wanna collect some data, I wanna collect some research. And then based on that research, I'm gonna then have to earn my paycheck and make a decision on where my value metric should go. There's a couple more complications in there, but that's the basic idea of how you do that. And then the last point before getting into Q&A, this is a point that like you have heard before. It's a point that like I'm gonna tell you again, and it's a point that only like 20% of you are actually going to listen to, but those 20% are going to have such a leg up. 
And that is basically making sure you do your customer research. Um, it was not as important 15 years ago. Um, it was not as important 10 years ago. It is getting more and more important every single year. And the reason is, is because if you think about it, any business, again, your, your life evolves around trying to drive someone to that point of conversion, trying to justify the price of the product. But if I have no idea who these people are, I have no idea what they find valuable. Um, even directionally, it's really, really hard to set up your pricing strategy, let alone everything else in your business. And 15 years ago, you could kind of like guess and check your way to success because you had time. You didn't have as many competitors. You had some funding maybe. Today, like you just don't have that time like you once did because there's so much other stuff out there. And so at the very least, without collecting any data, um, get something like this in your business. Um, so we have a spreadsheet. It basically like outlines everything, um, more categories than what you're seeing, but we have a couple of different profiles across the columns and then across the rows, a bunch of different categories of stuff. And then basically we, we first hypothesize without even collecting data, what are the most valued features, the least valued features, our unit economics, if we have them or estimating them. And what you're looking at here are two of the, the profiles we thought when we built or started building the metrics product, um, which wasn't going to be free, but we were like willing, wanting to charge for it. This was our initial look, just being in a room and being like, I think, you know, this mid or prize person will pay this much a month. We think this startup person will pay this much a month. And then even if I just, we just had this, it helps us kind of have good conversations. Oh, why are we building that feature? That's for a Steve when we really only care about Meredith. But it was really, really important for us to then go out and collect some data. And there's a lot of ways you can do this. Um, we don't necessarily have time to go through all of them. We've written a lot on them. I know Winter writes a lot about this stuff. But it's one of those things to go validate. And the reason to go validate is because this is what our personas ended up being. So Steve basically breaks even. If you look at the lifetime value and the acquisition costs, this doesn't even include our cost of goods, You know, our, our cost to actually run the business. And then Meredith was underwater by a factor of two. This is why a lot of analytics businesses struggle. This is why a lot of analytics business go up market because they go after larger and larger customers. But this is also why we were like, hey, we're gonna have to shut this down, go up market or make it free, which is eventually what we ended up doing. And I guarantee you, especially when it comes to monetization, there is a segment on some vision document in some like execs head, founders head, that was a good idea in theory, but is terrible for your business. I've seen it time and time again, where people kind of, again, guess and check their way. They don't realize until 36 months in, maybe they have enough funding to keep going. Maybe they have enough will to keep going. But they, if they just did a little bit of extra measurement early on, they could have saved themselves a ton of hassle. Um, but I'm going to pause there because I want to get in some Q&A. And I think we have a couple minutes here. But um, I want to make sure I answer some questions. And if there are no questions, I can just keep ranting, but uh, that's that's kind of a good foundation, I think, to keep going. Well, I have a lot of questions. Uh, so everybody else who also <laughs> has questions, please type them in. So, okay, I'm going to start with the doom and gloom. I love it. <laughs> uh, Let's do it. So, okay, acquisition is hard. Up market is full. <laughs> Product differentiation doesn't do yeah. it. So what, what, what's left then? Well, how do you win? Oh, you win. So what we've seen, and I, I didn't share this data, but I can send it if someone's interested. The best companies do balance growth. And what that means is, is that those three levers, all three of those levers are improving over time. Not necessarily at the same rate, but all three levers are improving. The companies who are not doing well, the only lever that's improving is acquisition, adding more salespeople, doing these types of things. Um, and so, you know, again, 15 years ago, this wasn't the case. When we look back in historical data, you didn't necessarily need to be as good at retention and monetization because, you know, acquisition was the game. And if you just think about channels, you know, like Google AdWords, a penny a click, you know, 20 years ago, you know, Facebook really cheap, all these new channels were coming out. We haven't had a brand new marketing channel since 2015. Um, if you count TikTok sort of, but then you know, TikTok, and then the last one came in 2015, and that was Snapchat, which not a lot of us are using if we're in B2B. So it's just one of those things where like, if we had all these brand new channels still opening up, it would it, we could probably still ride the acquisition wave, but this is why we're all reinventing like marketing, like ABM is just really good email marketing and good sales, right? And I know that I'm not trying to minimize it, but it's like, we're evolving these channels rather than like getting these brand new channels, which means we have to focus on our other growth levers as well. 
Thank you. Uh, and I have some specific pricing follow ups. So, um, pricing plans. So, value metric based versus feature differentiation between pricing plans. Yep. So, what companies typically do is also with every plan, you also get this feature, this feature, this feature. Yep. So, are you saying that just having the value metric change is enough, or would you still mm. recommend features in addition to the value metric? It really depends on your customer base, but look at, so, so to give you some context, like you have theoretically four types of pricing in the world of like software right now, you have feature differentiation. The only difference between plan A, B, C, D are different features, right? So you get everything and you, you get those features. Um, then there's like a hybrid, right? Which is what you're kind of describing where it's like heavy, um, you know, heavy feature differentiation still, but there's a main value metric. So this would be like Salesforce, right? So Salesforce, you get a bunch of features in plan A, a bunch of other features in plan B and so on and so forth, but then you also pay by user. And then there's like light feature differentiation with a value metric. So this would be like Slack, right? And the beauty of Slack is um, the only reason I upgrade is when I completely go to a different stage of business, right? So all of a sudden I go from free to paid because I, I need more than 10,000 message limit that they have. And I don't really go to the next tier probably until I have like a COO who's like, hey, we need all these compliance features. And then I don't really move to enterprise until like there's a really big reason, right? And that's a very simple like way of pricing. Whereas with Salesforce, it's like, oh, you're on, you only need these features, but you need that one other little feature. Sorry, you're going to have to upgrade to this plan. Like, Salesforce, not to complain too much about Salesforce because it's easy. We were we had like a five person sales team. When we started out. We're like, oh, what do we use? Of course, Salesforce, right? And they gave us API access to hook up HubSpot to Salesforce, but no API calls on that API access until we upgraded, which makes zero sense. Yeah, um, if, yeah it makes zero, like there's no reason to have access unless there's data flowing through it, right? Sure. And so we had to upgrade to like triple the price to get to this next year. So again, it's like that type of price. And then the fourth type is you get all of the features and the only differentiation is basically the, the, the metric. And so what you're seeing is um, you have just under 50% of companies that are still on that first type, just pure feature differentiation, right? There's no value metric. Um, you see this, especially in mobile companies, um, a lot of subscription uh, consumer companies, because it's a little bit harder, but even Netflix has a value metric where they basically have the number of screens that you're able to look at. Um, but most new companies are either going pure value metric or like Slack because that differentiation about, around features like Salesforce, it's just really infuriating for customers. And you're just seeing more and more people take advantage of it in the sense of their competitors. So um, yeah, long story short, I think that that's what I would do is, is either do light feature differentiation plus a value metric or just a pure value metric, which they both have trade-offs, but I think in the long term, those are the ones that are growing the fastest. Mm -hmm. And so let's say it's value metric based. Would you recommend this is now like Slack where they automatically upgrade or downgrade your bill every month, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, let's, and it may, maybe, you know, you don't add staff members unless you're hyper growthing that often, but like if it's pure usage based and so you don't know what is going to be next month, yeah. it could be a lot. And of course it's nice when it goes down <coughs> versus it's predictable, you know, because yep. finance people like predictability. They have their spreadsheets and budget. So how do you yep. play there? Is there any recommended play? Yeah. So it's, it's a bit difficult because you are seeing the, this whole like notion of, well, finance needs predictability that is starting to go out the window mm. because I don't know if you've looked at your AWS bill uh, on a given month, but most of the time that's not predictable. Most of the time that fluctuates. I mean, the thing you have to keep in mind is, is that it doesn't fluctuate unless there's a problem, like a very large percentage. Right. And so it depends on who your product is for. And it also depends on like the type of company. So what I mean by that is um, when you look at, um, when you look at something like Slack, I have committed very similar to my G Suite or G Work, whatever they're calling it these days. I've committed to that every time someone comes on board, I know that that price is going to go up. So I don't even think about that price, right? right. Same thing with like a salesperson and like a seat of Zoom Info or a seat of Outreach or a seat of Salesforce, right? 
Now there's other products and this would be like our retain product where we basically charge on the amount of revenue we recover for you. And that can fluctuate pretty dramatically on a given monthly basis. So we don't do pure usage. What we do is we have tiers, right? And the secret is, is that you want to set up your tiers so that no one gets upgraded dramatically once every probably quarter, like that's the maximum, unless they're like going nuts and then they understand that this is going to like fluctuate. So once every quarter, and then even then, like, I do want to make it somewhat automatic, like, Hey, congrats. This is awesome. You're getting more money. That's really great. We're going to move you up to this next tier right now in the early days, you have to get your confidence. So for us, we were like, weren't enforcing upgrades, which I know a lot of companies end up doing. And then you start to enforce them and realize that everyone's fine with it because they get it right. Um, so that's kind of what I recommend is like, just make sure you understand the buyer and how they think about your product. And then in some cases, the predictability be like, fine, but make sure you peg that number, not too high, but not low and make sure that there's like some sort of out in the contract where if it goes, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of charging overages on a limit, but if it ends up going like, I don't know, over 10% of the limit, then we'll talk about, you know, XYZ or whatever ends up happening. Um, I've seen that work really well. And then depending on how close you are to renewal, you know, if it's three, three months into the 12 month contract, I might go back and be like, Hey guys, we totally, this didn't predict, like we need to renegotiate use better words. Um, and then if it's like two months before the renewal, I might go, Hey guys, just so you know, like you guys are over, um, that 10% limit, not a big deal. We're going to be up for renewal in the next two months. Like, don't worry about it. And you know, if you want to get started now, we can have that conversation and, and just use it as a little bit of a give and a get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, two more things, willingness to pay and valued features by the customer. How do you figure that out? Yeah. So, um, willingness to pay is <laughs> let's start there. Right. And so the thing is, and, and I always like to say this is you aren't going to know exactly if you got this right until you put it in front of someone and put it in front of like, not even statistically significant group, but like a large enough group to like see the completes. Right. Now, when people hear that, they go, well, I shouldn't do any research then. I should just like throw it out there um, or I should do A-B testing. Well, 80% of companies out there do not have enough traffic to actually A-B test um, when it comes to pricing, let alone the multivariate test required to look at not only price, but features and all this other stuff. So I think that the big thing that you do is you do research in order to basically mitigate the risk of making a decision, right? And to find out something like willingness to pay, there's a lot of methods. Um, if you're going after, there's the Van Westendort method, there, and I'm just gonna throw out some of the names. There's Gaber Granger, there's a, there's a whole bunch of methods. And really, depending on the gravity of your decision <laughs> or the gravity of the impact um, and your risk aversion, it's going to like basically kind of help you understand like what type of research you should do. So we have some folks who they have like very bootstrap businesses, um, if their revenue goes down one month, it's not a, like if they don't love it, but it's not like an enormous deal. Like they're not going to go into business or anything. So they're willing to like, just by their gut, just double their price and see what happens. Right. Um, whereas you have other people who are like, well, we have a team, a sales team of a thousand people. We can't just willy nilly do a bunch of things. We have to do more diligence because it's a really expensive decision and they want to do like two to three months of research going through a bunch of different things. Um, so that being said, the method I recommend most that I think is really useful from like a uh, ROI perspective, meaning it's very like cheap in terms of time and material to do the impact might not be like the best out there compared to others. But I think given the cost of it, it's, it's very, very good value is the Van Westendorp model. And this model basically comes down to, it takes advantage of how the human brain thinks about value. So we think about value on a spectrum. We don't, if I asked you like, hey, how much is this cup of water? That's actually a really hard question for the human brain to understand, um, at least quickly. Now, if I asked you, is this cup of water worth more than these headphones? You'd, you'd say no, right? You just know it's not because it's a commodity. You bought headphones before. You have all this context, right? So what I can do is, is I can ask questions like, at what point would this cup of water be way too expensive that you would never consider purchasing it? At what point is it getting expensive, but you consider purchasing it? At what point is it a really good deal? And at what point is it too cheap that you'd question the quality of it, right? 
Now, my circumstance as a customer, yours as a customer, potential customer here, would change a lot of those answers. If you're in the middle of the desert for three days, you're a very captive audience when it comes to water. Right now, a lot of your answers are probably like nothing, right? Just because it's a commodity, right? And so those questions are really powerful. Now, the standard Van Wissendorp calculations are not like amazing. Like you can get to about plus or minus 15, 20% of reality if you do it right. Um, we've worked on getting to about plus or minus like three to 5% of reality with our pricing software. But again, it's like, if you're just trying to get like a really good dart thrown at the dartboard that has like some really good answers, it's really powerful. And I even like to use it in qualitative conversations like this. I love to be like, Hey, you know, we just had this conversation about the product. Like just, you know, what, what point do you think this would be like way too expensive per month that you just wouldn't return my call? Right. Mm -hmm. They struggle, they give an answer. Yeah. And then what point would you like sign the DocuSign today? And then they like answer, right? I'm not using all four questions, but I'm at least using two questions. And if you're a mid market or enterprise product, that's also a good way to do it. But it's all about being like disciplined about collecting the information over time. Amazing. Um, I see there are questions by the attendees here as well. So let's tackle some of these. Uh, Andre is saying, um, when you start a product, would you focus on building a good product or do pricing and do pricing at a later stage, or do you want to get the pricing right from the get go? Yeah. So the, the TLDR here is pricing monetization. So remember it's more than just the price. It's all this other stuff as well. It should be a, for lack of a better phrase, lifelong journey. You should be optimizing over time. Now in the earliest of stages, don't worry about like the specific price point. What I like to say is figure out your value metric because that probably won't change in the entire history of your business unless there's a major like upheaval of your industry. Um, so that probably won't change. So that's the number one thing to figure out. And then figure out like for this type of customer, whoever you think you're going after, are you a $10 product, a hundred dollar product, a thousand dollar product, a 10,000, like figure out like, where do you fit in that particular spectrum? Because those are the two things that are going to heavily influence you in the early stage. Um, and then the other stuff, like over time, like, should I put this feature here, or there, like you can figure that stuff out over time, as long as you have like, Hey, I should be doing something with my monetization every three months, at least. Um, again, not raising your price every three months. I'm just saying like, Hey, we added this add on, Hey, we're going to change our upgrade to annual discount, like all this other stuff. Uh, Sagar here, uh, needs another clarification. What is not a value metric? Like, how do you know that this is a value metric? Uh, maybe you can offer a quick recap on that. Yeah. Um, so a value metric, again, it's what you charge for. And so I would say that there's three kind of pillars of a value metric. It's got to be easy to understand for your user um, or for your sales process as well. So if I'm selling to an engineer with a touchless sales process, it can probably be super complicated. If I'm selling to a non-engineer, a complicated product, but I have like an enterprise sales process, I could have multiple value metrics, a bunch of other things. It grows with your customer. So meaning like I basically... Um, I'm not charging Disney's level of usage the same as I'm charging a Johnny or Jane startups level of usage. It's not always usage. Sometimes it's like consumption or some sort of value. And then like the big thing here is that it is a proxy for the actual value you're selling in your product. And this is a hard one, right? Because if you think about an analytics product, I can charge you based on how much data you have. Well, you're not going to want to put all your data in there, right? I can charge you based on the number of users. Well, I want as many users in there as possible because it's not really a active usage product. And so long story short, like it is an actual metric that your price fluctuates on based on consumption or some sort of value. Consumption would be like the number of contacts in your HubSpot account. Uh, value would be, hey, we made you this much money in this particular, um, this particular month. So we're going to charge you this much. What's your take on, you heard Kyle talk about usage based pricing. Uh, what's your general take on that? Um, I think usage based pricing is going to go like, I think it's going to go to the wayside eventually because it's, it's, it's not, it's not really where I get value. Right. And also like you're kind of taxing the thing that you want them doing, which is 
theoretically using your product. So you have these, you have these products and there's, it's kind of like this you where you have products that don't need any usage to get the value. So this would be like profitable retain, you plug it in and, and you get the value. You don't have to log in at all. It just works. And then on the other end, you have the spectrum of like, if they're not using the product every single day, they're not getting the value and something's wrong, right? Most of the products that are in the middle there, like die, they do not do well because you're either not providing enough value without my usage or I'm not using it enough to get the value, right? And so it's like one of those things where like, I don't wanna build a product in the middle and most products coming out are on one side of the spectrum or the other. Um, and so that's what that's what we're seeing more and more of. And so I think usage, it's it's either like going to go away in the sense of you're still gonna need massive usage, but the, the way you charge might be different. Um, so use, like some user-based pricing I think is, mostly terrible like i just think I, I think some industries like crms and stuff like that like you're just not going to get away from it because it's so ingrained in the culture and how the vp of sales thinks about their cost structure of their reps um but it's just that's not really where the value is coming from right and so i think that's going to die out a little bit but i think i think that's that's kind of how you have to think about it when it comes to like usage and patrick we are out of time so we even didn't get to the part two of your slides, but we're going to distribute okay. your slides sure. to uh, everybody who uh, registered for the event. Uh, so Patrick, thank you so much. Uh, everybody, you can find Patrick on LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, dropping knowledge bombs and um, cat pictures. Uh, oh, and I'll, I'll, I'll see you around, man. Awesome, brother. Appreciate you. Appreciate all the stuff you guys are doing. We'll see you.